Welcome uh, everybody uh, to this uh, event. Um, uh, I'm Dan Corey. I'm the Chief Executive of uh, New Philanthropy Capital, which is an organisation that is a charity and we work as a think tank and a consultancy trying to make the impact of the social sector uh, better. Um, and this is the second in a series of events looking at the way charities may play out in the policy agenda going forward. And the first was with Danny Kruger MP and former political secretary to the Prime Minister. And this event looks to the other side of politics. Uh, and we're asking, perhaps getting a bit ahead of our game, since I'm not sure people quite know what Starmerism is yet, but we've been, we're asking what might Starmerism mean for the charity sector. Uh, we're very pleased to have everybody uh, who's, who's joined this webinar on, and we have a fine set of speakers. So uh, in a little, we're gonna hear from Rachel Maskell, who is the Shadow Minister for the Voluntary Sector and Charities. She's done many other uh, jobs as well in the past. We have Paulette Hamilton, uh, I hope I'm going to get this right, Paulette, your Birmingham City Councillor. I know that's right. Uh, Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care and Vice Chair of the LGA Community Wellbeing Board. So very important roles and very relevant to a lot of this. And uh, we're going to hear from David Walker as well, uh, who's done many things in his life, uh, but is a journalist and co-authored with Polly Toynbee a number of books, including uh, the recent one on the lost decade, 2010 to 2020. And we'll hear from each of them uh, and then move to questions. And Tom, uh, our policy manager, who you can see will be monitoring the chat uh, and so on to try and pick up what the questions uh, are. And that's kind of how we'll, we'll do it. Uh, do tweet away and let everybody know that you're uh, listening to a really interesting event. But let me just uh, say a few things to tee up the discussion. Um, uh, certainly, Labour uh, was pretty good to the charity and non-profit sector in government uh, between 97 and 2010 in terms of finance, opening up contracts to them, having them in for conversations. Uh, Gordon Brown, who was uh, my boss, uh, even set up the Council on Social Action, which was chaired by uh, David Robinson. But I think it's fair to say that many on the left have never felt that comfortable with the charity sector. And when they are sort of saying nice things about civil society, they often tend to mean uh, only trade unions and co-ops. Uh, I'm looking through my hope, what I've said about this topic in the past uh, at an Fabian event in, in uh, a few years ago, focusing on the issue of charities delivering public services. Uh, I said, and I'm going to quote myself, which is a strange thing to do, but, but there you go. Um, mm -hmm. To really address some of the hardest social issues, we want more of our services based on the assets of the individual, family or community, and less just working out their needs and filling them. We want services delivered with citizens, not just done to them. We want to work in a preventative way, acting before problems emerge, not once they have reached crisis moments. As a general statement, charities are rather good at this stuff. And so if we want to tackle complex issues like reoffending, alcohol and drug dependence, domestic violence, loneliness, and so on, then we ought to be trying to use this sector. That does not, this is me still quoting myself, that does not, in my experience, always cut it with Labour folk. They see nonprofits as just another way of undermining the state, the thin ed of the outsourcing wedge. Certainly, we must make sure these reasonable fears are addressed. It's crucial they are not about undercutting terms and conditions, be that via volunteers or lower wages. We must still care about equity across geographies and income groups, and we must not relegate the key role of democratic bodies in the state. And I'm still quoting myself, but the voluntary sector, as part of the mix, gives us other benefits too. It helps give a voice to the citizens, especially those who cannot bulldoze their way through to good public services. It raises the interests of groups that are being ignored, and it campaigns for different approaches and different laws in different ways. They help create a society based on values and plurality rather than profit or bureaucracy. Now, under the, the leadership of, of Jeremy Corbyn, some left thinking went back to even older critiques of charity. And there was a big speech in 2018 by Owen Jones, the Guardian uh, journalist, uh, in the Hinton lecture. Um, I'm just going to pick a few points that he said. He recognised the need for charity in what he characterised as austerity Britain. He said, we understand the need for charity in the here and now to exist, but its existence is a failing of our current social order. And he quoted with approval a quote often attributed to Attlee, and he said, which, which is, charity is a cold, grey, loveless thing. If a rich man wants to help the poor, he should pay his taxes gladly, not dole up money at a whim. And Owen also said, um, and maybe this was the, the quote that, that, that got up the charity sector's nose a little bit, is we must work for a society where charity is no longer necessary. Now, whatever he actually meant, uh, and you can debate that, and he's debated it, this was taken to be quite hostile to the charity sector and representative of Labour leadership thinking at the time. Indeed, despite the efforts of several of your predecessors, Rachel, there seemed to be little reaching out to the sector in general. But things have changed. So 
What does the current Labour leadership think about charity and tricky associated issues like philanthropy? What does it mean at council and sub-regional level? And should Labour embrace the sector more or be wary of it as a poor substitute for state provision and action? We are about to find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of our, of our uh, panellists to speak for five to ten minutes um, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Really looking forward to it and Rachel going to ask you mm -hmm. to go first if that's okay. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks to everyone being on this, this call today. The dance between the state and the, and the charity sector has forever been thus. And um, as we've seen through, through time, the expansion and contraction between the two has never 100% sat easily. But I think one thing you can be assured of is that I know that how much value I place on the, the voluntary sector and I certainly objected it to it being called the third sector because um, I very much believe it has a, a central role to play with within our society, um, always has and always will and that's because of the energy and the dynamism of all of those which are volunteering, working for the sector and playing their role in civil society. So I really thank everyone for the part they have got to play. But um, I don't know if we really kind of define the isms of, of the, the leaders, but obviously what's really important is we set a framework of how um, I, I foresee and certainly um, I've built up this view from working closely with the sector of how we should take things forward. I myself was a trade union official um, for seven years, national officer working um, with the, the sector. And um, when the Office of the Third Sector was set up under Labour, um, I was a national officer kind of working with Ed Miliband representing workers in, in the sector. And of course, we've seen a real expansion of the sector and a maturity, as well as obviously having to reform and change according to the patterns of the time and, and um, the flexibility and versatility and all of those issues which the, the sector does to show its resilience and ability to cope against unprecedented challenges have certainly been tested and tried in the last decade. But I want the sector to find its confidence over the next decade um, in order to um, know that it's there, it's appreciated, it's got a vital role to play. And therefore that's taken me to, to three places. I was uh, introducing it as money, power, um, and and voice and partnership but um, on a call just last week uh, somebody helped me with my alliteration and put pounds power and partnership so we've got the three fees in there as a way of moving forward so starting with the issue of money obviously we recognize we're in unprecedented times at the moment um, and the real challenges are coming on on the sector I've read the the reports about the impact that's having we could be losing 60,000 jobs in the sector which would be an absolute disaster if you saw that happening in any other sector there would be outcry from government but because um, the sector does not have the power and the partnership th those losses and that pain isn't isn't necessarily heard as loud and this is where I want to move on to my second P but just staying with money for the moment obviously it's really key that we have an understanding of how we can help the sector through this very painful time. I believe the government has been incredibly slow at getting money out and also far too little of it. It really seems that kind of the loose change at the bottom of, of the, the pocket has been what's been thrown to the sector as opposed to um, really giving it a proper bailout support to see it transition into this next era that we're going to be part of. And of course, we know that social enterprises, charities play an absolute key role in recovery. And that's why it's vital that they are sustained and supported and all of those measures brought to their door um, as we move into this next phase. Of course, we don't have control over the Treasury as much as we're making representation to them um, over how to um, respond to the current coronavirus. But all I could say is if Labour was in government, I think you'd see a very different um, response moving forward. And part of that will be about underpinning, sustaining the sector um, in order that you can, instead of focusing on yourselves, can focus on the vital work that you're doing. And of course, the funding that has only come forward has really focused on the additional that you're bringing in response to coronavirus so all of that core funding which everyone says is incredibly boring we don't want to fund we don't want to talk about we know that such can't exist without it so it's really important that we understand what actually helps the sector to survive to move forward and do all the brilliant things that it does 
So money is going to be vital and making sure that those underpinning for a structure of funding will be important. Now, of course, the sector has been growing. It's been showing its resilience. It's been building its reserves in very, very trying times of austerity. Now, I had responsibility still of the sector as it went through kind of the, the big austerity measures 2011 and the cuts that went through. But somehow the sector... Yes, it's experienced a lot of pain. And I remember just the night after night not sleeping as jobs were kind of disappearing. And But at the same time, it, the sector learned how to diversify its income, how to really build a sustainable footing moving forward. And yet that has now been undermined by the current circumstances we're in. So we have to get the support in the right place in order that you can then carry on with the next chapter. And, and sadly, I think that is missing. And that is my criticism of government at this time. Moving on to, to power, um, it's an issue I, I talk a lot about a, a, a lot because it, it matters. And um, as a, a shadow minister and hopefully a minister um, for the sector, um, I'm not here to tell the sector how to do its business, what it is about and what it should be saying. The, the sector is more than articulate, more than capable of doing that self. But I think the sector has got to get the organisation right. And that means about having the voices in the right place. Now, under uh, Labour under the, the leadership we've got, it's really important that um, we create that space where um, we are led by the experience of the sector because there is one thing to be said of state, which obviously we have seen um, at close quarters over the last few months, uh, but we know that the reach deep into our communities, deep into the issues, most probably comes from whether it's community groups or, or, or voluntary sector organisations that really do address the hard issues of, of our day. We know that there's limited capacity of the state and therefore um, what comes from the sector is that additionality, that expertise and we've got to learn from that because if we are truly going to form a government which is going to address the pain of the country, bring the healing the country needs and to take our country forward without the partnership of the voluntary sector, we're not going to be able to do that. And that's just us being honest about where we move forward. So seeing the power that the sector has is important. But when you have a, a department at the moment, which um, no disparity to DCMS, but it is um, outsourced um, in, into a corner somewhere of government, we want to see the voluntary sector front and centre. And I think Labour showed its efforts well by putting it in the Cabinet Office where I think it rightly belongs. But also on, on top of that, um, I think what's really important is that we have a minister in the House of Commons, not in the House of Lords, and it does matter. Um, we, we currently have a spokesperson in each um, house just to cover that ground, but um, we very much want to see um, you know, proper voice. And hopefully, I've demonstrated over the last few months the way that I take it forward, and that has been having weekly surgeries with the sector, connecting with the sector, because um, it's about you. It's not about myself. And it is that learning and working with you that we've been able to take forward an agenda. Finally, on partnerships. The problem, as I see it, is that we have a relationship at the moment of servant master, where the state is, is the master and the servant is organisations that often work to contracts. But within that relationship, they haven't dared bite the hand that feeds them and therefore get the resources that the sector needs um, to provide the critique that the state needs. And that relationship is not a happy relationship. It's not an honest, true relationship where um, there can be those robust conversations. That has got to change. And therefore, to see co-production, to see at, sitting at the table of decision making, the voluntary sector being at the heart and, and key of that, that would change the way that government works, local government works, and obviously much else um, across the, um, the, the society, civil society. And therefore, I'm dusting down the old compact and looking at how we can give that a new lease of life. I'm looking at how we can go back to some of those relationships being much more on service level agreements with a long um, sustained relationship, not chopping and changing year by year, hoping the money will come, drawing up new contracts, which 
funnel the charities into the gap where the state believes it belongs as opposed to the state working with charities into the places where they're needed and therefore changing the context of that is absolutely vital you'll get more productivity more value for money and better outcomes if only the state would listen so hopefully um my pounds power and partnership um arrangements will of course deliver um, much more security for the sector and um, I think with that stabilisation being put in place then the sector can really find its voice, really be heard and ultimately transform our society which is what it's there to do. Rachel, thank you very much. An awful lot to chew on. Um, very, very interesting. Um, I, for one, at least, were, was pleased to hear somebody mention the compact which I don't think has been mentioned in polite company for a, a long time. Um, we're now going to hear from Paulette, and of course, it's always very interesting the relationship with uh, local councils, with their local voluntary sector. Sometimes it's a great relationship, sometimes it's always a bit difficult. Um, Paul, Paulette, tell us what it's like in Birmingham. Right. Now, let me start by saying we couldn't survive without, I agree with Rachel, I don't like the term voluntary sector. We couldn't survive without the, the third sector, without that part of our partnership working with us and I'm going to I'm going to concentrate on COVID-19 because I think it just gives the pandemic really gives us a good um, perspective um, because in in a place like Birmingham the pe pandemic has touched us as a community um, and all our lives and we've worked and we've lived and we've had to interact with each other and what's been really difficult is that um, it's affected different parts of our community. So the impact has been predominantly our elderly, disabled, people who live with disabilities, mental health illnesses. So the most vulnerable has been impacted. But what has happened is, even though the, the, the voluntary sector, the third sector, whatever name you want to give it for this discussion, even though many of them have been shut down, the funding is no longer there because it's dried up. And what we have to remember in this talk is that over a number of years, I saw it in a journal article, I think 2018 in The Guardian, where they started talking about funds being um, reduced when events were stopped and what have you during the last six months, many of these organisations that so, so needed their help, the funding was dried up. So as a council, what we had to do was to ensure that we made them a priority because if we needed that support in the community, we needed to fund them. But what it also showed us was that if as an, if as an authority, we didn't actually fund these organisations so that they were able to continue some of the absolutely wonderful work that they do, many of these organisations would have just simply gone under. And once they go, they struggle. We don't get them back. And because of the, the term that was used for today's talk um, about um, starmerism in charities, I actually believe that under the Labour Party and the leadership of Sakia Starmer, it does want to move the party. We do believe in anti-austerity anti and I do believe that um, with us removing, moving away from the fractionalised way we were working, being more joined up the way Sakia Starmer has been saying, I do believe that there is a place for charities. And even though the Labour Party has talked about everything being nationalised, I think that there is still a place for our charities and, and the work, the wonderful work that they do um, out there. And I just wanted to say that... Um, at the same time, in Birmingham, we saw demand spiralling and people were already struggling financially and emotionally in terms of health and the artist it, it and the restrictions. But again, our voluntary third sector charities, they... They, they just absolutely pulled it out of the bag. They, they really knew what, they understood the community that we were trying to get to quite quickly. And as a local councillor and as somebody that heads up, not just adult social care, but public health, 
food banks in Birmingham have absolutely increased. I don't know what the proportions are around the country, but in Birmingham, we saw a massive increase in food banks. And what we had to do then, and what I have been doing, is visiting them because I needed to see where the issues were, how, what the issues our third sector, our, our charities were having, and how we could support them. And it was incredible what they managed to do very quickly with very small amounts of money. And also listening to um, what the charities and people in the community were talking about, the tragedies, the heartaches, um, but how people just seem to come together to support each other. So as part of this, we cannot get rid of charities. We have to move forward with them. We cannot believe that they're not needed because they actually are the pin that sometimes is needed to keep what we're doing in communities with some of the strategies that we have to do. And despite the overwhelming ob obstacles that the voluntary, the faith sector have continued to face. I can't say it enough. They've done some amazing work and they've also gone into the space in many authorities around domestic abuse and child abuse and what the lockdown showed was how versatile many of these um, organisations were and one of our key worries um, because I am a mental health advocate, was around mental health uh, in, and the voluntary, sectors, the voluntary sector, yet again, they were able to diverse and do some of that well-being work that our families so needed at a time of crisis. And I, the effects of the, the lockdown are yet to be fully realised. But what I'd like to say is that some of the, um, the most vulnerable the lockdown is going to be catastrophic. And I'd just like to say that without the voluntary sector, the charities, the third sector, whatever, how we want to name it, and without their ability to co-produce with us and to help us get into those areas quickly where our most vulnerable are in those areas, I feel as local authorities, we will absolutely struggle because by, uh, Birmingham, as everybody knows, is a super diverse city, right? It is very vibrant. It is, um, it's got a rich social fiber. It's um, our local communities, our voluntary groups, our charities. Some of them are just so very small, but they're absolutely linked into our communities and what they're doing. And, um, they absolutely know how to meet the needs very quickly. And charities have a massive role to play in society. They are trusted. They work with our most vulnerable. And I believe that if we continue to work with them in, co in a co-productive way, we shouldn't just tell them what to do. We should be working with them to ensure we shape our policy, we look at ways forward, but also we see them as critical partners that are funded going forward. We cannot keep reducing the funding to these areas and then expect them to carry on doing the same amount of work or even more. So I believe that the Labour Party, have, they have got an absolutely valuable role to play with charities to ensure that that co-production, and I'm going to use that word again, because we have to treat them as equal in the coming months and years will help to shape our policies leading us into another election because things are going to change. And just to finalise, local government will never be the same again. We've had to do things very quickly. And I will say it now, without our, our, our charities, third sector organisations, we couldn't have responded the way we have over the last, well, during austerity and especially during the last six months. And I'd like to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paulette. Really, really fascinating. And I think it's, I think one thing we've picked up at, at, at MPC, um, talking to lots of
of charities and lots of uh, people in local authorities is you know, one good thing, if, if it's a good thing that's come out of COVID, as there's been much better working together. Sometimes the relationship with the local council, with the local health, uh, public uh, health uh, and the NHS so is, not, is not always good with the charity sector. It's been a lot better, partly because everyone has just you've got to get on with it and they've dropped all the reasons why they can't work together and uh, accountabilities and financial flows. And they've all just said, we've got to do it. So let's hope we cling on to, to some of that in the future. Uh, so thank you very much, Paulette. Um, uh, David Walker, who is a, a fine commentator on all sorts of things, um, I'm sure will have an interesting view on this area. David, really looking forward to what you're going to say. Um, thanks very much, Dan. Can you all hear me? I've had some tech problems, as they say, this morning. Um, and thanks for the plug for the book. Um, Polly and I wrote uh, out recently, well worth reading, as an account of the decade leading up to, uh, to COVID. Um, let me start with a binary. Um, which charities might fear uh, a Starmer premiership. Um, public schools, uh, universities, the Royal Opera House, there will be a sector of what is the broad voluntary sector which one might hope a Labour government would be critical of and possibly move to amend the charitable status of. Dan will remember the previous Labour government got around to thinking about the charitable status of public schools, did begin that, but it's a difficult area and backed off. So there will be some charities which might fear uh, Starmer's arrival in number 10. Equally, there will be a number of charities which directly would rejoice, uh, to use that word, if he were to be seen on the steps of number 10, particularly children's charities, particularly charities which operate broadly speaking in the community. Now the evidence base we have at the moment for Starmerism is slight but clearly his genes link with the genes of the Labour Party and the Labour Party was in power, Dan will remember, for uh, a number of years uh, in the 2000s during which time a lot happened particularly on the social policy front. Um, there are there's reasonable grounds to expect a revival of aspects of that golden age. And it was a golden age uh, for many charities. If I can take uh, someone, Anne Longfield, uh, who is currently the Children's Commissioner for England, Anne ran a charity called Four Children, and it was glory days. Unfortunately, Four Children uh, uh, had went into administration during the years of austerity after 2010. But the, the story of four children as the supplier of services, as a partner of local government in the Labour years was uh, uh, a great story. We've seen, uh, Rachel mentioned some of these, uh, Keir Starmer name checking a number of charities, particularly those which have served. Uh, Paulette just mentioned this during, uh, during COVID. So one might expect the general atmosphere around the voluntary sector and, the Labour, and a Labour government to be benign. Some might point to the appointment by Keir Starmer of Claire Ainsley, the former director of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, as an indicator of his uh, closeness uh, to the sector. But Claire's appointment does raise a question which I'll briefly uh, lay before you. At JRF, under her and her predecessors, there was a large body of work on poverty, research directing uh, our attention to the persisting uh, problems of poverty and income and related inequalities. And Kia, as we know, has criticised, we've heard this from Rachel to some extent, over centralisation of power and resources in Westminster. But, the big but, like all his Labour predecessors, he would necessarily have to couch any progressive social policy in terms of initiatives for the whole of the country, whether that's England or the United Kingdom, and necessarily would be joining in policies which had a central thrust to them. That's, in a sense, in the genetic makeup of social democracy, uh, I would argue. Now, we know that Labour's history, temperamentally, historically, is connected deeply with voluntarism. Labour has a lot of tolerance for the, the voluntary sector. The cooperative party remains still part of the Labour uh, family uh, of elements. It sprang, we know, out of friendly societies, trade unions and churches. And the faith element in Labour still uh, is a factor. And there are those that may belong to them who say Labour took a wrong turn into statism, into the belief that the central state was a necessary deliverer uh, of progressive policies. It could, they say, have relied better on local initiatives. But 
in an unequal society, place is unequal, locality is unequal, and successor Labour governments, and I would argue a Starmer government, were that to come to pass, would confront that historical dilemma and say, when push comes to shove, it will have to be the central state that ordains progressive social policies. We cannot leave it to the initiative of what would necessarily be a variegated and unequal body of local actors, whether they're in local government or uh, in the voluntary sector. To make a, a crude point, forgive me, Jarrow couldn't help itself. The marchers marched where they marched on London to secure redress from Westminster. And that, that model of securing the tax revenues that only the central government can distribute would, I think, remain the case uh, if Labour were to come to power. The Red Wall Seats famously voted uh, last year for help which only the centre uh, could give them. So you get the gist, gist of that argument. Labour will always look kindly on charitable activity in general, especially that devoted towards children and the relief of poverty. But its policy making will always inherently be centralist because only a strong centre can raise the resources necessary for redistribution to people and communities and areas in need. Now, you could try and find state forms that permit local activity. The New Deal for Communities, again, Dan's a veteran of the activity that went uh, into that. Um, but Labour will always seek to answer this question. If in, area e, if in area A there is no provision and there is lack of local voluntary activity, it'll necessarily have to be the state that tries to move resource from richer, where better off, area B uh, into area A. So, um, Labour, as we know, distrustful uh, of uh, the move, the strong moves to privatisation and contractualization we've seen during the past uh, 11 years, would, I think, come to pass slightly suspicious of a model which we've kind of heard echoes of this morning, where charities have become and would wish to remain major providers of service. I've heard the word co-production a number of times, and I wonder whether those in the voluntary sector in NCP might be reflecting on whether that's a good look in a context in which deep suspicion has now been uh, laid about the performance of non-state providers of essential public services. The taint, if that's the right word, of circle could attach to voluntary provision. And I wonder if we need to draw a line. I've heard both Rachel and Paulette arguing for um, the, the robust conversation, the critique that the state needs. And I think Starmerism would welcome uh, a vibrant voluntary sector that was an advocate, that was a strong pusher for change. But I wonder whether that's compatible with a voluntary sector that's also in the business of co-production and providing, and as some Labour activists would see it, supplanting the role of government, which alone can secure Unit, uniformity of provision uh, across an area. So I'll conclude by wondering whether the more campaigning, the more advocacy that we might see from the voluntary sector, the more radical charities are over the next period of time, the less like service providers they are, the more their future would be secured were Keir Starmer to come to power. Thank you. Very much, David. I think you put the, the those arguments, um, which are often heard in in these debates, uh, very well. Uh, I mean, some of them are about the fact that almost by by definition, <laughs> the voluntary sector or whatever we call it, which we've been debating a bit during this, um, uh, appears where it appears, uh, not necessarily where it's needed. Uh, and so, what does that mean? And how does the state play its role? Uh, and so forth. And then, obviously, also. Uh, an issue about um, whether services, you know, local authorities or health don't want to provide all the services themselves uh, to the extent they're putting contracts out um, to um, the voluntary sector as well as to the private sector. Is that sort of OK or not? And I think Rachel talked a little bit about whether I think you, as people talk about, should we be moving away from contracts and back to I think you were talking about service level agreements, but certainly sort of kind of grant based kind of approaches so lots of lots of issues so thanks for that David and I suspect we'll come back to those in some of the uh, questions and uh, and of course um, uh, uh, Rachel and Paulette do come back on what David said in answer to these questions but I'm just going to ask Tom who's been monitoring hard uh, what's being said uh, Tom is there, a, is there a sort of a, a first bundle of kind of questions or something that, uh, that you want to bring up yeah would you would you like a group of three 
Um, uh, give us two, I think. I, even two. I can't remember three. So, okay, um, so I'm, I'm kind of synthesizing a few uh, similar questions here. Um, but there's there's a couple of questions about whether there's a, a future Labour government will see charities kind of purely as providers of services or if they'll see them as a channel through which um, voices of marginalised groups can be heard um, and what the a future Labour government might do to enhance or restrict uh, campaigning by charities. Um, and within that, there's a kind of sub vein about um, social value in, in policy making and commissioning and whether that's going to be a priority for Labour. Um, and then there's a more kind of straightforward question around um, what does Labour consider the role of the Charity Commission uh, to be? What should it be? And is its uh, £27 million budget adequate for the work that it does? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yes, that, that, that uh, um, second one is, is one for the connoisseurs, but I might ask Rachel to, to say something about that. But I don't know, Rachel, do you want to go first? I mean, the, you know, in a sense, it sounds like those questions, Tom, are trying to sort of uh, pose a kind of conflict between providing services and providing voice. I mean, sometimes charities feel that themselves because they're providing a contract, but under current sort of government rules, it's always argued whether it's really legal or not, but they feel they're not, they can't speak out if they're providing the service, which has caused all sorts of problems. But I mean, do you see that as a bit of a conflict or is it, you know, in a sense, we can do both and have everything? First of all, uh, I think it's very clear that Labour would want to see reform to the Lobbying Act because clearly that did um, silence many organisations from being able to um, undertake the, the roles that the charity sector is there to, to play. And, and it's really important that we um, move forward to ensure that we free up the voice of voluntary sector organisations. A wise government would listen to council. And therefore, that, where does that council come from? It comes from the organisations which have built an expertise in particular areas. And therefore, absolutely, it's really important that that voice comes through uncritiqued, un, uh, pure in the sense that, you know, it doesn't have to adjust it, its voice in order to, to match its audience. We want to hear that raw voice that is coming from our communities locally, nationally. I think that's really important. I just want to address as well an issue that David raised about inequality. And, and where that comes from, if I, I may, because um, I think um, when we talk about statism, um, often you're putting, talking about inputs rather than outcomes. And I think there's a real risk that we could get into the argument that we want a universal provision. Absolutely, we do. But when it comes to outcomes, we know that where there is greater deprivation, that the outcomes are worse. For instance, voluntary sector organisations are less likely to be placed in the areas of greatest deprivation. And therefore, you get this double inequality which is being built. And if I can illustrate that through um, the one of the pieces of work that I've been undertaking about where is the voice of black organised um, charities, there isn't a, a big unified voice and that's why the Black Lives Matter campaign has been so important because it's saying actually we come into one space in order to articulate this suppression that we have experienced across our society. But because there isn't one organised voice, we haven't seen the policy changes, we haven't seen the dynamism which is needed in Westminster in order to put this agenda front and central, and therefore you get this ensuing inequality and, um, quite frankly, discrimination, which is built in to the structural inequality that we see. However, because of the funding mechanisms, and we must remember the resilience of black organisations, mainly locally funded year on year, hand to mouth funding. Um, as a result of that, you have no opportunity to build your power base and therefore influence change. So I think we have to recognise there's real inequality across the sector, which then builds into how we are able to deliver. So you absolutely you need the state. And that's why you need co-production, because organisations um, who are doing fantastic work on the ground will never, ever be heard. And that's why that relationship needs to be building um, with purpose in order to positively hear the voices which aren't being heard. So I just wanted to throw that out as a, a thought reflecting on what David was, was saying there. But I think it's absolutely vital that we hear that voice coming through and that we add that social value into policy making. And I remember the discussions back when Labour was in power around um, how do you measure that? You know, that's all about, you know, how do you weigh that? And um, Labour produced, um, when Angela Eagle was in the Treasury team, a document called Buy and Make a Difference. And it was very much looking at how you can use the, the mechanisms of the state. And of course, we're in Europe there and had to bounce around procurement. Um, but how you can use those mechanisms to actually demonstrate 
real social value that you're able to put in. Which, just if I may touch on the issue of the Charity Commission as well, I think, I mean, I'll compare many of these um, inspectorate bodies, if I can put it that way, as um, coming in and dealing with the problems. Is it under-resourced? Well, it, I don't think it has got the focus it needs at the moment to understand what it wants to do, and that's a problem um, with an organisation. But if I, I say we used to have this old school inspectors that used to come in and help teachers and, and classes and schools get into the right place. Today we've got Ofsted, which comes in, assesses marks and then disappears off. I think we need a more enablement model to ensure that charities, which obviously struggle through the system, you know, um, in, in order to reach compliance to help those organizations really find how to navigate how to get their their books in order how to make sure they've got good strong governance whilst at the same time ensuring everything is protecting the public and organizations so it does need a refresh the charity commission and i just feel it's just got that lack of direction and leadership which is really needed at this vital time Thank you, Rachel. A very interesting comment at the end there. This kind of MPC, we've, we've kind of taken the view that, that that kind of help that you talked about is absolutely needed, but be separate from the regulator. And we propose something a bit like the old Improvement Development Agency for local government. But we'll, so that's maybe something to have into the debate. Um, I mean, do you mind if I make the point that sure, Rachel is typical perhaps of Keir, slightly kind of pulling her punches. <clears throat> the chair of the Charity Commission is a Tory. She was appointed because she is, or was, a peer, a Tory peer in the House of Lords. If you look at a range of public appointments recently, the Royal Opera House, the potential BBC, the National Health Service, the Tory government has appointed pals, cronies, and allies to these positions. It would be odd if Labour came to power and said, we're above, we're above all that partisanship, and we're not going to have any appointments except those which are entirely meritorious when the Tories have done the precise opposite. I mean, whether they would tolerate the present chair of the charity mission con continuing, I don't know, but should they? I mean, it would be perfectly legitimate now for a Labour government to think about some of these jobs at least being filled by people who were broadly sympathetic to social democracy. Would that be so terrible? <laughs> an, in an interesting point, David. I think that was a, that was a pitch for a job there. Um, <laughs> no, um, but <laughs> sorry, uh, for me as a local councillor, the issue has been over many years, we need some of these local voluntary organisations. Rachel made it absolutely clear, they're out there living from hand to mouth while we're deciding what policies we are going to go forward with. At the moment, the Labour Party, over the last few years, their policies, in my humble opinion, has been excellent. But the problem is that people didn't trust that we would deliver on these policies. If we're talking about nationalising everything back in local government, so everything comes back to us, it would kill us at the moment. With everything that's going on, with the lack of funding, with the lack of resources, bringing in all the services just wouldn't work for us. So we do need to be very clear as a party where we stand we need to have clear policies so local authorities like myself are able to, to, to actually do the job that local people want of us so that we can deliver the services that certain organisations, especially certain voluntary organisations, the very big ones that are very well organised, do not absolutely drown the sector and we do not hear the voices of some of the, my, the smaller organisations that deliver a lot of work that are quite unique but sometimes can't find their place in the market. There has to be some clear policies that we can work towards and at the moment I'm afraid I know we're discussing it today, but there is nothing absolutely clear out there. And we're making guesswork about Ukia um, employed. We're making guesswork about what they said in The Guardian. We're doing guesswork about what the Commission is doing. The Conservatives are doing what they want to do. The Tories, I'm happy for them. But we've got to be clear on what we need to do and then bring people along with us. And I'll shut up. Thank you. No, a very interesting pull out and, and, uh, and an appeal for a bit more kind of direction, although, I mean, it's early days and the next election is, is a long way off. Who knows what the world will be like in a few years. Tom, is there a, another uh, couple of questions? You're on mute. Yes, um, there's a, an interesting question about the um, how 
Labour councils and local government could work better together in future. Um, kind of raising, the, the questioner raised some issues around uh, tight specifications, councils offering low hourly rates, um, restrictive clauses, um, and asking if, if COVID is going to change that relationship, and maybe make it a bit more positive, at least for the, for the social sector. Um, and then there's a question about how the civil society should engage um, with the Labour Party, both kind of with the national party ahead of the next general election, how it can feed into the policy making, um, and how it can engage at a, a local government legacy with, with, uh, level, with the addendum of um, asking about the previous civil society strategy um, under Steve Reid, and if that is still kind of in play or, or not. Um, okay, I'll go straight to Paulette first, I think, and particularly on that that council thing. Actually, you talk quite a lot about um, how you work at Birmingham with the um, with the uh, local voluntary sector and the issues about the smaller ones and so on. I mean, do you think you could you could do that better? Are there better ways um, that that you can do it? Um, what is you're on mute, Paulette? <laughs> I am ever so sorry. I keep doing this. No. You know, whoever asked that question, it is a really interesting question because the Local Government Association has been looking at this issue over a number of years, actually, not just months, because in certain parts of the country, it is far more difficult to get social care staff because of the rates of pay that they get. And so they need to use others sometimes to fill the gap. So it's, it's a discussion that's ongoing. I believe what the Labour Party are now doing is, is a really um, wonderful thing. We can't get to that point as local government on our own. So what Sakia Starmer has done is looked at inclusivity. So with um, the Local Government um, Association, we are working very closely with people who have the lead for these areas. So um, John Ashworth and his team, we're working really closely with them in the health and social care sector to look at some of these issues and ensuring that we develop the policies going forward. But I also think for that to work around costing and to make sure that our charities don't feel as if we're pushing them out, because I haven't heard an argument today to say that nationalisation in its entirety will work. And I know it's early days, but I do think that a lot of people will become unemployed if we ignore a sector that is working really hard at very low wages. So I'm going to come back to my argument again that, Dan, these discussions need to be going on, but be inclusive. And the LGA have started those discussions. Local governments have got to look at these things because people are no longer going to be put up, putting up with freezes in their wages year on year because the country, the public sector, they're, they're actually getting poorer. The voluntary sector, some of them are living on the breadline. So we have to have policies in place to ensure that people are working at a level where they feel that um, it's cost effective. Thank you. David, to come, come to you. I mean, people often say, you know, that one of the problems is, you know, we have the public sector, we have the private sector, and the voluntary sector is a kind of uh, left, our, uh, you know, it's an afterthought, um, and it will kind of fill in some gaps that the public sector couldn't fill in, or the private sector has filled in, and that that somehow the key to good, you know, policy making and making a good society and economy is getting them all working together. I mean, what should a, you know, is is that right? And and how can a Labour government secure that um, if that if that is the right thing? Can I, before answering that, make a, just a brief rejoinder to Paulette? Let's not forget that the LGA is conservative controlled. Let's not forget that large tracts of England are controlled by conservatives who still are not that willing to spend, who don't have progressive social policies in place. In Devon, in Lincolnshire, in West Sussex, in North Yorkshire, in Kent, in Oxfordshire, in Buckinghamshire. And so any Labour government would have to confront, as you well remember, Dan, the problem of securing local provision of necessary services, for example, Sure Start Centres for Children, in areas where local government is deeply reluctant to provide. That's leaving aside the sort of general question of local governance. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's this... A Labour government would clearly not want to replace the role of existing uh, voluntary sector provision, but 
I think its direction of travel would be to question the large element. I mean, Paulette mentioned large charities, the, you know, the Barnardos and Mines. I'll give you a brief example of an area. I won't name it. Um, what mental, in mental health services, there's a program called Improved Access to Psychological Therapies, Behavioral uh, Therapies. In this area, IAPT is provided by principally MIND, but also by the NHS and by a private company. MIND's capacity to criticise the lack of provision, and there is a, a deficit, the lack of provision of IAPT services is reduced by MIND's participation as a major service provider. So I think that tension would be more dramatic under a Labour government where Labour might actually welcome the advocacy, radical critique role of voluntary organisations. But I repeat myself, I think would be you know, reluctant to see the voluntary sector becoming corporately large. I mean, small advocacy, BAME type charities, absolutely fine. Labour proved when it was in part, it welcomes them. But the big providers of voluntary sector services, which look remarkably similar in many respects to private companies, I wonder whether that model really has uh, uh, um, scope. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, I mean, I don't know, Rachel, if you want to sort of pick that up a little bit. I mean, there's always this thing, you know, th that we all love um, a small, local, embedded community uh, organisations. And then there's a bit of suspicion of the big ones. They're a bit too corporate. They may be providing a lot of services, uh, as David says. Um, you know, uh, they're not really the charity sector anymore. They're sort of a, a non-profit version of Circo or something. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Where do you think Labour's policy should go on that kind of thing? I think many organisations have changed themselves in order to um, be able to compete in a very competitive environment. And therefore, um, instead of having confidence in themselves, what they've done, they've morphed into what society has thrown at them or governments have thrown at them. And I think certainly if they're up against the circos who are undercutting um, contracts coming in, underfunding the true value of those contracts, and then bombing these expert um, organisations out of the way, then they're saying they're kicking back in the way that they know they can to say, well, actually, we can be, prove we're better than you. We don't want to create that competitiveness, which means that we don't get the authenticity of organisations. So um, this is why I think we have to dig down into looking at that relationship again. Um, with real incision because um, the reality is, you know, we don't want necessarily the big generics like Serco coming in, running services, making a profit out of um, people's misfortunes and circumstances, as opposed to bringing real expertise, which is deep, which is rooted. And this is where real local groups come in because having that local knowledge Having those relationships with other organisations and providers, that's the web in which the voluntary sector best serves the community. And therefore, being able to move forward. Now, obviously, um, many of those larger um, organisations, think about children's charities running Sure Start and, and so on, they've done a fantastic job and they have got real expertise and localism. So that whole federal approach is really important. And I think as we move forward, we've got to look at not just um, status and the, the kind of everything coming out of Westminster because I just don't think that's real. There's 168,000 organisations out there and there's no way that any one government can have that relationship but actually if we look at how we can see a more devolution of decision making and empowerment which comes back to the issue of trust. Will a government actually trust people other than their own which sits around that cabinet table? You know that, that's where it comes back to you now clearly at the moment we're into this centralist control era which has probably never been so channeled through one person but as we move forward we would want to see many more voices and recognise that I would say it's a, one individual doesn't necessarily have all the answers but between us and the society we definitely have the solutions and we've got to take that approach of, of reaching out more and therefore changing the relationship will be a vital part of that and trusting organizations to get on and deliver what they best know as opposed to what we think they should be doing and should um, best know. Thank you, Rachel. We, we've only got five minutes. So I'm just going to ask a kind of last question and go sort of David, Paulette, Rachel, just to finish off. So apologies to, to those who haven't got to their, their questions, um, but we have, we have kind of noted them and we'll try and keep them at Kim alive in different ways. Um, I, think, I think somebody mentioned that obviously, you know, one of the jobs that uh, Rachel's got to do and kind of Keir's team uh, is to come up with a kind of 
uh, I know a revived kind of uh, policies uh, towards um, civil society. People mentioned that there's a, the, the, the latest one was was when Steve Reed was in the job. Um, I'm just basically saying, you know, what what each certainly David and Paulette, and then Rachel can go back on it. You know, what are the one or two things you'd like to see in that? I'm gonna go David first, and then Paulette. Well, briefly, it's back to the future. I think a revival of that relationship which obtained before 2010, the recreation of the Office for Civil Society, which was dedicated to building up, to supporting the sector at large, a major reform of the Charity Commission, possibly its merger into that, that office, I think would be a way forward to, to show Labour's commitment to the sector while reserving the right for the centre to decree necessary social policy locally. Thank you, David. Paulette, what, what would you fancy to see in that? For me, the local, local organisations, local voluntary organisations work really hard out there, but funding is never sustainable. So for me, going forward, I'd like to see somewhere with the new policies that some of this is, becomes quite statutory, that if we are going to ask, ask ask them to work in the unique ways that we're asking them to work with. They're not living from hand to mouth on a yearly basis. We actually commit to that in some way. And then secondly, the people that are on top running some of these, um, the, the, the bigger type organisations that we really start to look at. I, I do believe some of these provider contracts need to be um, removed. I'll be honest, I do believe that. But it's how it's done so that their place is made clear in the system as we go forward. Because if they don't have these provider contracts, the problem they then have, have is how they sustain staff funding and the organisation. But how is um, the Labour the Labour Party going to work with them that perhaps we we encourage them to be far more unique but provide the funding that's needed and they don't have to go into this provider type contract scenario because that makes things really really difficult because they then have to go from is it gamekeep poacher to gamekeeper to be able to sustain the model and those would probably be my two because those are the things I face on the pit face. No, very interesting. Paulette. Rachel, you, you don't have to tell us what's going to be in it, but you might just put, tell us what your kind of plans are. Well, I think for me, kind of the, the most important thing is that the whole sector finds its confidence again. I think it, when the sector has um, its own self-confidence and assurance, it then can project its voice in a different way. We need to ensure that that voice is then projected into the right places and completely agree with the, the comments made, particularly around the whole localism agenda. Um, I, I think, you know, we've got a, a real opportunity to look at where power sits in our country. Um, and this is what the, the agenda of politics is all about if we, we get down to it. And the, the fact that we need to release that power and trust the sector and, and ensure that it can find its space as opposed to being told where its space is. I think we will be able to deliver in a far more secure way. And ultimately, this is about the beneficiaries of all of those organisations. And that's where we've got to keep our focus on 20 million people volunteering, amazingly fundraising, giving of themselves and their money. And we need to make sure that people across civil society are really empowered, served well. And what I would finally say is we need that voice to come through from the beneficiaries, not just from the organisations of which Africa and their party. Rachel. Thank you very much. I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed this conversation. I think it's um, it's really important. It's really early days of a, of a kind of new Labour leadership and people uh, working out exactly what they want to do. Um, but I hope, you know, this discussion is clearly a, a happening everywhere and I hope this has been a useful contribution to it. Thank you very much to Rachel, Paulot, Paulette and David. Thanks, Tom, for looking at the, at the questions. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this webinar uh, and have a good rest of the day. Thanks a lot. <laughs>